Welcome, everybody. Uh, so to this session, uh, it's called Creating a Smart 3D City Web App. And uh, my name is Pascal. I'm director of the SE R&D Center in Zurich, where we develop the 3D part of the JavaScript API, Scene Viewer, CD Engine, and uh, also some few other apps. <clears throat> and here with me is Joe Schmidt. He's, he's uh, the, the development lead on our side on JavaScript. And uh, yeah, so we will talk about um, how we build um, um, this custom urban planning application using the JavaScript API. And uh, you, s you might have seen it in the plenary session very quickly. And uh, we will also explain a bit like how, how this, um, on the one hand, how, how, how the whole data processing worked. And uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, how this work influenced the whole querying and filtering mechanisms which we have now in the JavaScript API. So, but before I start, um, yeah, some credits. So Joe and I are actually um, presenting stuff here uh, for, for these two guys. Uh, so on the left side, there's Lisa. She was actually as intern working on this and we hired her now as product engineer. So um, she has an urban planning background and she did all the work here. And Javier, um, he's our product engineering lead. He actually, um, yeah, he was, uh, he was supervising this and driving it. So, uh, so yeah, we are presenting basically their work here. So, so yeah. Um, so or from an overview point of view, where are we here? On the one hand, we, um, I, we first talk a bit about like how we used Pro and CD Engine to um, publish the stuff in Portal, um, the required layers for this urban planning application. Then, on the other hand, we talk about how we used the uh, um, JS API to create um, um, an uh, application. So, let's have a look at the application. Um, so, Joe is going to make some live demos afterwards. Uh, I'm, I show uh, this movie here, which basically shows this application called See Through. So, just that you get, before we actually start, get an idea of the whole thing in more detail, and also the motivation behind it from an urban planning point of view. So, what you see here is the city of Zurich. And uh, so, I think these are about 300,000 buildings. And he and there we have basically per floor we have spaces, so-called spaces, uh, where we have each usage. So like oh, usage we mean like residential or is it office or is it industrial, uh, storage, these kind of usages. So it means it's quite a lot of features which we have here. And uh, what you see here now is um, some unique value renders applied all in real time on this. And now you see um, you can go click here on this, um, on, on basically the legend on the right side, and then um, in real time it highlights, um, it highlights the corresponding um, class of, of, uh, of features. Um, so we, we really wanted to have this interactive um, workflow where actually also people which don't have a big GIS background can go and really go in and explore a city and especially for urban planners what's interesting is is the is is the actual yeah what are the usages of this of this of these buildings. So here's a typical example of an urban planner is doing. So typically now first let's let's go into more detail here uh, with the application. So here you can go and you can select um, just a building. So before we, we did, we worked on the whole city. So now we just selected one building. Um, in the meantime, we also, there's coming up, there's, there's some more highlighting stuff, but this is more like for the, for the session tomorrow, for the roadmap. But yeah, yeah. so here now I, I go in and see, for this building I see the statistics on the right side. What is the usage? Um, I, can, I can look at the stuff in more detail. So the city of Zurich really has it per per story. They know like okay, 30% is parking, 50% uh, is residential. So they know this. They have this information. Before. And this is also part of this talk is that there are different. Every city has it in a different way, etc. So here you also see the actual gross floor areas. Um, so you see small um, the distribution of spaces, some bigger spaces, some smaller spaces, etc. So here now, um, what Lisa is doing here is now she's actually now inspecting this open space here. 
So now she, we have multi-selection, so it's now five, five buildings, and now she selects more. So here we have this open space. It's called the limit plot in Zurich. And uh, when you want to really figure out, uh, from an urban planning perspective, does, does an open space work? Means, is it, is it livable? Is it ha does it have a high quality of life? It's about like how many people are there? Uh, is, does it live? Are there people walking around? And to actually figure that out, what drives this are basically the mom and pop stores. Like small stores, you want to have them, you want to have many small stores on the ground floor. So, currently, what they do to figure this out is what they currently do is, and they want to figure out like how good is this from a, from this kind of quality quality of living point of view, how good is this space? What they do is they basically take an intern and tell him like go to that space and then walk around and 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 write down the the number of moment moment pop stores you see there. That's seriously that's that's how how they do it. Actually, Lisa had to do that before she started uh, uh, with us. <coughs> so. So uh, that's, that's really how, how, how that currently is, because it's, this data is so distributed in different departments. Nobody has access to it. It's horrible. So what we see now here is after we selected the surrounding buildings, we go in and we just select the ground floor, because the ground floor is of interest for, for the quality of the, of the of this space here. And now, and now we go in and we select only the retail, um, so just show me the retail ones. And now we can actually even go in and filter um, the small retail stores. So because you actually want to have small retail stores, like again, these mom and pop stores. So you see there are quite a few here around the space. So this is why you actually can say, just by looking at this kind of data, that um, this, is, this is a livable urban space. And that's a good planned Space. And this is also what the urban planners do. They go in and say, like, we want to have more retail here, or we want to have more office here, or more residential. So, so that's kind of the idea of this application. And, uh, and yeah, it's really, um, um, we showed this um, to uh, a few urban planners, and they were all super, super excited, because there's really nothing available like this yet. And, uh, and especially what you see here, this is all in the browser. This is, um, and it just works. Um, it's just, it's, it's very simple to use, and, and it really gets access to um, the understanding of the actual, like, like uh, why, um, yeah, like, yeah, for an urban planner, how does the city work? Here you see the one big building in Zurich, <coughs> um, the Prime Tower, of course, most of it is office. And, uh, <clears throat> and yeah, so, so here you see the, the, the different spaces, and here again, like this interactive selection, also the, the, yeah, the AM charts, which are at the same time uh, used as legend and selection tool. <coughs> so yeah, um, I hope that gives, gives you kind of an idea of this, of this application we did. So to, to uh, summarize, um, so our motivation for doing this um, was so we did this as an R&D project in Zurich. Um, on the one hand, uh, we uh, also because of City Engine, we work mainly with uh, with city urban planning departments, and uh, they have so much data. However, I know we have all the um, information models and and, uh, and and schemas. However, in the real world, they actually they. Typically, they don't use that stuff, so they—it's always kind of like sometimes they take a bit of that and they take a bit of that. So we were wondering, like, how can we combine stuff there? The other thing was um, um, really like the urban planners who didn't had really access to that kind of data easily. So really provide easy access to this, and also confront the urban planners with such a tool. Then because currently they say we don't need this because they don't see that it's so it's yeah. There's, uh, they don't know that this would be possible. Then um, and going kind of in the same way is, is what I mentioned already, that uh, the stuff is not accessible. Also for the public, of course, it's not accessible. Internally, um, we use that also internally, basically. That was one of the, our, tests, our tests, how we developed the new JavaScript API features um, to, uh, yeah, for example, 
making the querying fast and, uh, and and all this kind of stuff. So this is kind of like how we work internally in Esri. Like we always kind of try to also make at the same time while we develop something, we try to make some use cases, some real world use cases, and then see how it how it works. So the workflow. Um, yeah, we have some data sets uh, of the, the, the cities. Um, then we do some data processing uh, with all kinds of tools. I'm going to talk more about the detail. We publish the data, in this case to portal. Um, and then afterwards, um, Joe will talk about the actual application. So I will talk about, um, about five minutes about the whole data processing part and uh, and and uh, yeah what we what we did so we did actually we tried three uh, data sets the one end we had zurich uh, vancouver and dubai and all were completely different data sets um zurich was um, the whole city extent and they um, and there they really have per floor data um, for for usage this is like there are not many cities which have that Vancouver, um, they have, um, so this is from Esri Canada, it's a beautiful data set, it's actually for real estate, but there we have rooms and every room uh, has a type like, uh, I don't know, elevator or that kind of thing. So it's not, it's not the actual urban planning usage, it's the actual room type, but it's a huge data set with lots of lots of uh, um, yeah, rooms. And then we have Dubai, which, uh, which is more kind of a BIM case where we have very detailed um, 11 buildings which very detailed geometries and uh, where we kind of tried out this kind of use uh, concepts also. Um, so yeah. Um, so the application by the way is called See Through. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk now a bit about the data processing part. And uh, so yeah, be warned, it's not easy, <laughs> it's not simple. So, uh, but you see here that we are really doing these processes to actually really figure out what are the pain points and then try to fix it. So here now we basically present you um, the workflow like what we did. So basically we have, we have some LOD2, um, LOD2 um, models here on the left from, from for, for the city of Zurich. Then what we, what we needed was, uh, we needed per floor features. And then, and then um, yeah, once we had the per floor features, we actually really need to um, put attribute on them. So how did we do that? Going basically from LOD2 to um, some, some attributed spaces. Um, so first, um, we used Pro to um, basically clean up the data um, and and then actually with some SQL stuff, they had the data of number of floors was in another, uh, the city of Zurich had addresses, so, but that was in another uh, geodatabase or actually it was, it was an, an, just a database in Excel actually. <laughs> so we had to, um, yeah. Um, uh, make all these kind of uh, table joins and stuff. But then at some point, yeah, we added the num we were able to add the actual real number of floors there, which was to the LOD2 data sets. So this is very already very important. Like there are these LOD2 things, and then there is the number of floors. Very often not connected. So this is your problem number one. Um, however, yes, you can do that. Then we use CD Engine to basically um, clean up um, the geometries. Um, then another problem was that these that these shapes were below ground. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And uh, so yeah, we had to do some magic with the uh, with the underground floors also, etc. Then so we we managed to do that, and then <laughs> we went back to Pro. <laughs> And, uh, and there, because we don't have um, a table join in CD Engine, so um, then we actually added the per floor data, which then there's another um, somewhere database of the city of Zurich where they actually know in the third floor of this building there is 40% <coughs> is, is used for residential. So at the very end it was just a table join, but again. So then once we had that data per floor, we then had to split the floor into, again, into features according to these percentages. And uh, 
there we actually, I think, I hope we fixed that now. So that we had a problem in Pro, so we, we had to go to CD Engine again. <laughs> so back to CD Engine, um, split it into floors, and then again got back here. And the, the latest table join where we actually added the, um, the actual attributes, the usages to every feature. So yeah, we know that's not ideal. <laughs> we work on it. Um, but um, this is just like how it is um, uh, in, in cities today. And of course, we try to um, improve that and, uh, and make this, these workflows better. Um, here are some details. Um, so here you see the or LOD2, uh, which the city of Zurich has. Um, we added the data, so we have uh, upper and lower floor data. Then in CD Engine, we, what we actually have to do is um, we have to um, uh, figure out where is, the, where is actually the ground, because these LOD2 data sets, which they had, they were just like going like 20 meters below. They didn't care about the actual underground floors. They just went down. So again, this is just, this is in every city different. So they purchased this data from somewhere and, and, and their data just went down uh, because I, whatever, I don't know. And uh, so yeah, we had to cut it at the, at the actual um, um, ground floor level. Then we had to, um, um, yeah. So here this, that's actually this cutting I visualized. And then um, what we did is we had the, in, the data, in, the, in the database, we knew the number of underground floors. So we then, what we do is then on the top, we just take the existing LOD2 and split that. And then on the bottom, we really extrude the, um, the number of lower floors. And, uh, and that's then how we got basically our approximation of the reality. So this is all in City Engine. Then again, uh, then back to Pro. Um, where we then did, did um, and then at the very end we ended up doing this. So um, we did this. Um, so so this was just a Zurich example. Um, every asset, every everything is a bit different. So for Vancouver, um, for Vancouver, yeah, we we had to do some on some other on some other tricks and stuff here and there. Um, and uh, and with Dubai, that was actually very well prepared. I think actually by Matt Bueller here. <laughs> uh, so there we didn't have to do much actually. <coughs> so um, so yeah. So now we have this um, this data sets here um, in as as multi as geo databases, and uh, and then we need to publish them. So and again, this was. I think more than half a year ago. So in the meantime, that also got improved a lot. So um, yeah, we we had we had to publish it using web layers back then because these were the only ones which uh, which come with a feature layer. So um, back then, so and only on Portal. Um, so but in the meantime, um, all this stuff is on Arches Online, and I think even with with uh, scene layer packages. Um, yeah, we are, we are working on this, that, that we have more and more feature layers. Uh, like, so means you always, when you have a scene layer, scene layers are good for visualizations, and uh, they are fast, etc. However, all the stuff which Joe is going to show, not all of it, most of it, uh, requires, uh, requires a feature layer, where you actually really have the data, and, and uh, this can then also be, of course, be connected to your geo database. Um, so yeah, um, what we then, uh, so here you see the, the, the actual web scene then, uh, which got published with Pro. So yeah, that was basically the whole preparation step. And, uh, and it kind of shows like what, what cities, um, as also the challenges which we as, as we have to actually um, explain to cities like what they can do and what, what they have, what kind of data they have and what they can, and do with this. So yeah, um, that was my preparation part, and now I give it to Joe. Thanks. I'll just briefly start here, but then I'll have to move over for the demos. Uh, so I'm just moving on. Well, no, actually, I actually can talk about that. Um, actually, I would like to start with that. So here's the application that you've already seen, and it's actually it's kind of split up into component. When you 
I mean, I don't know how many of you built. Actually, I'd like to know how many of you have used the JavaScript API 4x in this room. Okay, all right. Um, so when you build a larger application, you have to kind of think about how you want to structure your code. And uh, this is kind of, I would say, a medium, small to medium application, but um, it's split up into several components, and each of those components is something visually on screen. I'm going to go through them, but they also um, reflect a module in the, in the JavaScript application. So it's kind of um, component that, or yeah, split into components, the application. The, the main one is the, the viewport. This is essentially what the JavaScript API will draw for you. So um, that thing is the scene view that you instantiate in, in the JavaScript API. And then there's a number of uh, UI tools grouped around it. There's some that are overlaid into the view, uh, for example, the search window on the top there. And uh, some of these are actually available as widgets from the JavaScript API, including the search widget. Uh, this below ground button, um, I can show you briefly what that does later. Um, I think it's also a JavaScript API widget, actually, that's, but it's used a little differently as uh, it's intended. It's, it, I think it's a base map switcher. Uh, in the JavaScript API, but here it's used for something else. Um, oh, sorry. And then on the top right, there's a selection widget, which essentially just shows you how many how many buildings uh, are selected. And then um, the visualization widget, which has the charts, um, but also controls the way that the selected buildings are rendered in the viewport. So um, as you click the buttons, like usage or, or area, you've seen that the visualization changes in the viewport as well. So we just, for the software architecture, decided that the visualization widget is the guy that tells the view how to render which building. And finally, there's a, a filtering widget um, that allows you to narrow down, uh, after you've selected uh, buildings, not allows you to, to narrow down the, the selection even further. All right. and so. Back to the previous slide, uh, there's a, a couple of components that went into making this application. Uh, the JavaScript API for X, um, and then AM charts for, for all of the charts. Uh, there's many chart libraries out there that you could use. Uh, we just picked up AM charts because they look really nice and we had it available, but I'm sure you could uh, be happy with, with many other um, alternatives. And then some help for sliders and for fonts and layouts. All right. So actually, for the remainder of this session, I'm going to talk about code. Uh, and it's mainly going to be about the scene layers, how you use the scene layers to make these things happen. Because the, this is kind of the central, um, I mean, I don't, if you don't know the scene layers, as um, Pascal has already mentioned, it's, uh, it's, those are layers built for visualization in 3D. Um, Originally, or the, the first layer that we had was the mesh layer. So this was the way, this is the way to get 3D objects, uh, 3D meshes into the JavaScript API. And but now we're extending it with other data types. Like uh, the, we, you also can do points. We have that point cloud integrate, point clouds integrated meshes. But uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk only about the 3D mesh or 3D object scene layers. Um, so when we look at the application. As uh, you've already seen in the video, one central element is selection. So users can uh, select one building, or then they can extend by holding shift. Um, uh, they can extend the selection and, and, and select multiple buildings. And, and one thing you'll notice is that the selected buildings are rendered differently. Um, and only the currently selected buildings are affected by the, the visualization tool, right? So if, if I unselect it, it actually it, it uses it applies the, the visualization of the visualization tool onto every building. Um, but also these statistics, if we look at the statistics computed here, like for example number of units, you'll see that grow as I add more buildings to the selection. So the, the visualization tool really kind of operates on a current selection. And but then you still have the other buildings in the background, um, all the unselected ones. And there are multiple ways that you could implement that, but the way uh, we, we or Lisa and Javier chose to implement it for, for this example is that they actually added the same data set twice. They created two scene layers and pointed both to the same uh, portal item or the same URL. 
And one of the scene layer is, is, uh, is designed to hold the active, which means the selected buildings or the selected features. And the other scene layer is all the inactive ones. Um, so, and this is where the first feature comes in that, that I would like to highlight. This is the, the filtering, because now you want the active scene layer to only show those buildings which are currently selected, and the background or passive scene layer, all the other buildings. And that's done by simply setting a filter for the currently selected buildings on the active layer, and then the inverse filter on the, on the passive or on the, the background layer. Okay, and then um, let's talk a little bit about the, the visualization, about the, the rendering, kind of the coloring of the units. Uh, as you start the, the application up, or as, as long as you're here in the visual, visualized by none, uh, it just uses a simple render. So the active layer assigns one symbol, essentially one blue fill symbol, and the passive layer, as, um, the background layer always has this kind of gray or white um, simple render and, and fill symbol that is applied to it. Now, as I switch to usage, um, you can see that the buildings are colored by usage. And we use a unique value render to, to obtain that. Um, I can show you the SDK sample, actually, that shows that one nicely. So uh, this is from the JavaScript SDK, one of the, the, the samples that you can look at. It's a very simple sample. We have buildings, and they have uh, the usage type in this bit weirdly named attribute. Um, and then what we do in the API is we create um, three different symbols. One symbol for residential and, oh yeah, sorry, forgot to mention this is actually using a, a feature layer and we extrude the buildings in that case. But uh, that's important to note that you can use the simp that all the renders that you can use for feature layers, you can also use them for scene layers. And uh, similarly with the symbols, um, there's actually for the scene layer, there's only a single symbol that you can use. That's the mesh symbol 3D combined with the fill symbol layer that you can assign a color um, to the buildings, sorry, yeah, to the features. Uh, but when you use a unique value render like this one here, you can say that I want the color, or sorry, I want the features to be symbolized based on an, an attribute. So you give it a field name. And then you can say for each field value, what should be the symbol that I want to assign to that feature. And in this case, we have these three different types. We have residential, which will create an orange fill symbol, um, condominium, which will create this uh, uh, purple fill symbol, and then anything else, this is the default symbol, will be, will be rendered in green. So that's the, that's the code that we use also in see-through to assign different colors to different uh, usages. And then uh, when you select area, sorry, I shouldn't switch back and forth so much. Uh, when you go to the area visualization, um, the render that we use is a, a simple render, but we use this concept of visual variables. Um, this allows you to color, to define the color of each feature based on a continuous color ramp uh, for a specific attribute. So I can actually see that oh, I, um, you can change the range within uh, this color at, uh, within which this color ramp happens. So now it's from zero to 370 um, square meters. We go from yellow to like this kind of darker blue. And uh, uh, if I change this, uh, if I change the filter, it'll rescale the color ramp to go between zero and 180. <coughs> and it'll also filter here, it'll remove all of the features which do not fall into that category. But that's done using filter, that's not the render. Uh, that's actually not true, you could do the render as well, but that's not the point, sorry. So uh, what's done there, um, the way this is implemented into this code is, as I said, uh, when you switch to the visualization by area, we again assign a simple render with a mesh symbol 3D and a fill symbol layer. And we don't actually give any parameters to the fill symbol layer, that would typically not look like, actually it will take a white as a default color. But then we create this visual variable, we say this should control the color. And the field that we want to color by is the area. And then we define two color stops, one for the minimum area that we want to visualize, and one for the maximum area. And we give the two colors at the two extremes. And then the render will interpolate the color between the minimum and the maximum value for the visualization. Uh, 
All right, so I've already um, talked about it a little bit, but the filtering is uh, one of these new features that we've introduced in 4.3 based on the research that we did with this application. And uh, it's actually surprising, like this is a, an extremely simple feature. All it is, all it does is it adds this definition expression property to the scene layer, which you may already know from feature layer, it does exactly the same there. But this is actually a, a huge enabler for these types of visualizations. So this, we noticed that this was a very important feature. It's, I guess it's easily explained. Um, you give it a SQL expression in here and where you can use the attributes of the features. For example, here I'm saying that I want, all the, I want the scene layer only to show the features which are of usage type residential and have a total height of smaller than five meters or feet or whatever, or feet would make sense, I guess, whatever the data happens to be in your, in your database. Um, you can then, like, so this is shown here, you can do this in the constructor. This will mean that, like, initially as the scene layer loads, it will already be narrowed down to that selection. But at any point in time in your application, you can just assign a new definition expression to the layer, and then it will automatically update, so immediately update. So here, this is like switching out and actually showing the, um, now showing the buildings that are larger than 15 meters. And this is the example that I was referring to before. Uh, this is how we made, how we used the two layers and made them show the entire data set only once, but the active layer would contain some feature and the background layers will, will contain all the features that the active layer does not contain. So again, this is just a, a simple SQL uh, expression. Uh, you, can, you can look up the documentation for feature layer for, for scene layer, how to do that. Um, and here it says, okay, in the active layer, I want to have only this build, these two buildings, the two buildings with these uh, object IDs or building IDs. Um, and in the background layer, I want all the other buildings essentially. So in see-through, the uh, filtering is used for selection in the sense that I've just told you about, in the sense that we have these two layer, and one layer contains a selection, the other one, the, the non-selection, and we use filtering to kind of assign the features to one of these layers. Um, you can also filter by floor. Uh, in in see-through, it's used to filter by floor, so um, I haven't shown this, but uh, it's, it's been in the video. You can say here, specify that I only want to see um, all the units of a specific floor. Um, you could filter by a specific usage only. It's probably more visible when I, when I switch to usage here. Um, and then you can filter by, by the floor area. So these are the kind of filters that, that we have in see-through. But obviously, you can use this for, to filter any of your attributes, like whatever question you'd like to answer with your application and whatever values you have available in your data, you can, you can use that as a filter basis. Some other um, use cases or other ideas for use cases that you could do with this filtering is, the one is you can mask out buildings from uh, a scene layer. Let's assume th this is kind of a typical use case is this redevelopment scenario where you have uh, one um, data set that contains all the buildings of the entire city. And now there's a certain area which uh, is, is, is being redeveloped and you want to evaluate, for example, diff different scenarios. So one way you could do is you could take that data and publish a specific scene layer that contains only the buildings around it, but not the ones that you want to actually swap in and out in the application because it's different redevelopment scenarios. Um, but that may take a lot of space because these scene layers can be huge if you have like thousands or hundreds of thousands, millions of buildings. So the other way to do it now with the filtering is you can just filter out all of the buildings from that sort of base map scene layer that you are going to tear down and uh, where you want to show the, the new buildings. And, so, and, and that's what it looks like then. All the red buildings are removed and instead you add in a second scene layer that contains only buildings in that uh, development area. Uh, you could also use this potentially uh, to have, like you could, if you wanted, bake multiple scenarios into one scene layer and then um, use filtering to switch between them. But I would actually advise, I mean, there may be some use case where this is great. Uh, it's probably better to just bake individual or create individual scene layers for each scenario and then just turn these scene layers on and off. You can just toggle visible on the scene layers. Um, uh, that's better because one of the things uh, I need to mention about filtering is that this is done on the client side. So 
it will always download the entire data set, or at least the data set for the current view that you're in, and then only at, in the client side decide that, oh, I'm not going to show that and that and that feature. So you cannot use filtering to optimize the download perform performance uh, of, the, of the scene. It will always download everything. And this also means that if, you're, if you have a huge scene layer, but you only show a single feature of it, um, it may take a while until, until that feature appears because it's going to load all the data around it um, and you don't know at what time that feature comes in. All right, so much about filtering. Now let's move on to querying. Uh, this is again a new feature in the 4.3 JavaScript API and there are four methods, uh, query features, query feature count, query object IDs and query extent. And they are available on the scene layer and on the scene layer view. Um, now, since many of you haven't actually used the 4x JavaScript API, this is the, the layer and layer view is a new concept that we introduced. Uh, we did this because you can use the API both in 2D and in 3D. Um, and we wanted to have like one part of the API that is common uh, among, among, both among 2D and 3D. And that is the map and the layer. That's kind of your data interface. You create the map and then you add layers to it. And the layers define what kind of data that you want to load. Like they point to a certain URL. You can uh, put the definition expression there. You can uh, actually put the renderer there. But then for every, uh, when you actually want to see that map. So if you just instantiate that map, it doesn't show anything. That's just a data container. So when you actually want to see something, you have to create the view. And in the 3D case, you want to create a scene view and then attach the one to the other. So that, and then now the scene view shows all of the data in the map. And you can actually, um, you can actually create multiple views. You can, for example, have both a map view and the scene view pointing to the same map and put it in your application at the same time. They will show the same data, but they will, you can move around in them individually. Um, and then for each layer that you have in the map, the scene or the view will internally create a layer view. So just like the scene view is kind of the view on the map, the layer view is then the view on the layer. So this is a bit complex, but it was just necessary to introduce this abstraction to be flexible in the terms of 2D and 3D and having multiple views on the same data. Um, now, for the, when you when you want to when you want to obtain the layer view, the layer is what you create yourself in your application. You say new scene layer, give it the URL, and then you do map .add layer. Uh, and you the scene view you also created yourself. You say new scene view, and here's my map. But the layer views are automatically created, generated. Uh, whenever you add a layer to the map, and there's a scene view, it'll it'll notice that oh here's a new layer. I'm going to create the layer view for it. But then later on, if you want to interact with them, and we will see a few reasons why you might want to, um, here's the way that you can obtain the layer view. You have to call this function when layer view. And this is an asynchronous function. It returns a promise because at the moment in time when you call this, the layer view may not yet have been created. This may be loaded in dynamically. So this is just a, a hoop that you have to go through whenever you want to use the layer views. All right. So why am I telling you about this? Because all of these query features are available both in the scene layer and in the scene layer view. And they, they behave a little differently. And depending on what you want to do, you may want to use the one or the other. Uh, so obviously the question is when to use which. And unfortunately, the story is not so simple. I'm going to try to simplify it in the end. But here's kind of like the, the gory details. Uh, first of all, when you execute a query on the scene layer, it will be executed on the entire data set. That query will actually go to the feature service and will be executed on the server and will return um, the information there. However, when you execute it on the layer view, it is only execute the client side on the features that are currently loaded um, for display. The uh, scene layer um, query kind of supports all different query types. By query type, I mean you can, uh, you can give it a, we'll see that later actually, you can give it a uh, SQL where clause, but you can also say, I just want this and that object ID. You can do a spatial query. So there's kind of different query types. The scene layer one uh, supports all of them. The scene layer view is limited to what we have currently implemented in the, in the layer view. This will likely glow, grow over the future. Right now it's quite limited and you can see the documentation um, on scene layer view for the, for the individual query methods of what's supported there. 
so now these, the, the, the first two are kind of constraints on the scene layer view. So, so you might think, why would I even want to use the scene layer view? Now here's two reasons why the scene layer one um, actually requires a serv server round trip. So as I said, that query is being sent to the server and then it comes back and if you have a large result, it'll take some, some time to, uh, to actually stream down. Whereas the scene layer view query is done on the client immediately. Uh, or it's, it's, not, it's also a, a synchronous function, so uh, it will be a promise and it'll take a little bit of time, but it, it tends to be much, much faster than the, than the scene layer query call. Um, also, the, so this is the story that Pascal has talked about. We actually need this feature layer in the back end of the scene layer to do this, the, the scene layer queries. Um, and this is a bit like we're working on that. This will be more, more often the case. When you publish from ArcGIS Pro, it'll always be there. So it's always for, for you to use. Um, uh, but if you, for example, as you know, or as you may know, the scene layer is boosted uh, is in the back end. We have this data format called I3S. And it's an open specification, and we have partners writing out um, uh, these SLP keys containing I3S. And if one of these SLP keys is published to a uh, to to portal or to online, um, then they I think currently do not have a backing feature layer. Working on that. Working on that exactly. That's what I thought. So so depending on where you get the data from, how you publish it, it, it may or may not be possible uh, to do the, these kind of queries. Whereas the scene layer view. I write here, it always works. There's some, again, it depends on the, the I3S data containing all the attributes, which is the case when you publish it from, from City Engine. It's also the case when you publish it from Pro. But depending on where you get, get the data from, it may not actually contain any data that you can query. All right. So let me try to simplify that. When do you use which one? As a rule of thumb, when you need the entire data set to be queried, then you have to use a scene layer query. <clears throat> However, for example, a typical case is that the user clicks on something, and then you want to do something with that. You want to obtain information about that. And in that case, we, you know for a fact that the feature is in view. So then you can use the scene layer view and, uh, and, and be faster or, or save, this, save on this requirement of having to have the feature layer in the back end. You can uh, check the capabilities of the scene layer with this function, get field usage info. I would like to refer to the documentation, how it works exactly, but that um, will, as a response, tell you whether you can do this query or not. All right, so uh, now I'm going to step through uh, a number of samples of how you could use this, these query functionalities. They're all very simple samples, but I hope they will inspire you to actually create your complex use cases based on it. Um, so the, the first one is, uh, uh, it's very simple. You have, it's a database query, right? We have a, a, a number of features and we want to find out all of the features that have a specific usage, for example. So to obtain that, we create the new query object and we tell it in this case that we want all of the attributes of the resulting features to be returned. You could limit that down to only the attributes that you need. And then we have, we use this SQL where clause to say that we only want uh, to get the buildings or we want to get all the buildings that have usage type office. Then you do layer.query features. You pass that query into it. As I said, it's an asynchronous function. It has this promise thing, so it doesn't return immediately. But you do that then and give it a function. And then that function will be is kind of the callback that will be called once the query is uh, returned. And the result will contain an array of features. So you can now iterate over these features and, and do with it whatever you like. You can uh, show it to the user or do uh, statistics on them. Things like that. This is actually the way that the statistics are done in, in see-through. We just uh, we query the currently uh, selected features, and then we do the, the, the statistics on the client side. Uh, down here, I'm only going to show this once. The query can fail for various reasons. One of them is, for example, the capabilities aren't there. Um, it could be that it times out, whatever. And this is the way that you, uh, you catch that error, and, and then you uh, deal with it. Oh, one thing I forgot to say about the capabilities. And about this get field usage info, obviously um, the the capabilities will remain the same for your data set after you've published it. So typically you will not need to do this check in the in the application. You may need to do this while you develop it to check, oh, actually that data set there, can I use it? But once you've determined that you can use it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's going to stay there. All right. So. Like finding features is, a, is, is probably the simplest uh, query example. 
Uh, another um, example is if you want to get the attributes for a specific features. Now, maybe you, if in the case that you already know which feature you want to get the attributes for, you can just um, add, use this object IDs array here in the query object and just give it the object ID. Uh, and again, you have the outfield star. And then that will return a single feature. Or actually, it may you would have to really check. I mean, if you're sure that this object is in the database, then, then you're fine. But maybe you need to check if it actually returned one. But then you have the feature. And in the feature, you have all of the attributes of that feature. <coughs> all right, here's a more complex one. Here's the one where the user clicks on a feature. And I'm, I'd like to show you that one live. Um, so this is a sample. Actually, it's based on a sample that we have in the API. So this is a SDK sample that shows query and, and, and filtering. I've modified this a little bit. The, uh, the data set is the uh, Esri campus in, in Redlands, and it has all of these individual rooms. And the rooms come with uh, attributes, like the object IDs, and then what floor, what building name, and so on. So this click, the, the pop-up that you see here, this is a capability that the API has built in. You don't have to implement that. You just set the pop-up pop template on the scene layer, and you set pop-ups enabled, and then it'll automatically uh, pop up when you click on something. But maybe you want to have a different behavior. Maybe you want to actually do something in your UI um, when the user clicks on one. <clears throat> so here's how you would do that. Whenever the user clicks um, somewhere in the view, th this click event here is issued. This is a very simple event. All it gives you is the, the point, the screen point in pixels um, that you, uh, that where the user clicked on. Do you mind grabbing me a cup of water? I can really try through. Thanks. I think there's back there. Thanks. Sorry. Um, <coughs> just want to make sure I can still talk after five minutes. Um, so then, once you have the, the screen point, you can call hit test. That's a function that will actually test for a certain uh, screen point what are the features beneath that pixel. We don't give you that information in the click event already because it's potentially expensive to compute. So, and when you don't need it, we don't want to like spend that effort and figure it out and then you just throw it away. Thanks. So this means that if you want to know which feature was clicked, you have to call this hit test method. As a result, you will get a number of hits. In the scene view, it will actually always be one hit, the, the frontmost one, because in 3D, typically, you don't see what's behind it. That's actually also the case in 2D. Um, and then based on that, so the hit contains a graphic, um, this kind of the feature, but um, the graphic does not contain the attributes yet. That is owed to, these, um, to the fact that we say that the scene layer is, is mainly for efficient visualization. So when, you, when we download the data from the server, we don't download all of the attributes. We only download the ones which um, are necessary for display. If you have a render, then we need to download that specific attribute for every feature, but we don't download any of the other attributes. So this means that in this graphic, <coughs> the only attribute that you always have is the object ID. And if you want to uh, know if you need a specific uh, field or attribute from the service, you then need to go on and issue a query against the service. So you say, okay, I know the object ID. Um, I want to have all fields for that object ID. Then you uh, push this query into query features. And here, as a result, I'm just printing the attributes to the console. So we can see that if, uh, if I now click on, on a certain building, it'll take some time, it'll load some data, but then it'll uh, print out all of the attributes that were um, stored in that feature. All right, so that's that use case. Um, Next one is you may want to be uh, you may want to know all of the distinct values for a given field. That is the case, for example, in see through. Here in usage, you, you see all of these strings here. This is computed from this like this is not hard coded, but we actually fetch all of the different values that we see in the data and present those to the users. And the way to uh, to achieve that is uh, this property return distinct values. That will cause the result to have one one feature result for each distinct value that it sees. So it doesn't return all of them. Uh, it only returns one of them. Um, you specify the field that you want to get the distinct values for. 
And you, at the moment, you have to use this where one equals one. I think actually that's a bug. Um, I've been looking into that. Um, <coughs> shouldn't be necessary. We should do this for you. But uh, right now, you, that's, that's what you need if you want that. And so then down here with the result, what I do is I, uh, I use this map. This is like new JavaScript ES6 kind of um, behavior. But what it does, it just is extracts all of the, the usage um, fields. And what you get then is, is just an array with each, all of the strings that are uh, possible for usage. All right, and finally, final example is um, to query the extent of a feature. Oh, sorry, it's actually a second to final example. You can query the extent uh, of one or more features. So the extent is kind of is the bounding box, of the envelope, and um, it. The query in the query, you I mean, the query may match multiple features, and the extent that you get back is only one, and it envelops all of the features that you specified. Let me demonstrate that. I've implemented that here, uh, that just if I click on a building, I find out its object ID and I do this uh, extent query. And then I, I keep adding to that list of object IDs um, unless I click somewhere in the back. I keep adding to that uh, list of object IDs that I feed into the query extent. And you can see what I get back is, is a, a 3D extent um, that envelops all of the features that, I, that I've clicked on. We can look at the code of that. Again, I'm using the, the click event and then the hit test to find out which feature the user has clicked on. Um, oh, sorry, wrong source code. Here we go. But nevertheless, we use the click event, we do the hit test. Um, <clears throat> I'm using this view.graphics array there. This is a place where you can just put in like line, polygon graphics, and so on to annotate something in the view. I clear this so that so that I can, I can prepare for a new um, selection, uh, and then if there is if the if I actually clicked on a graphic, then I find its feature ID, I push it into an array of of, uh, of feature IDs, and then I call this method query and show extent. If I didn't click on anything, I'm going to empty it. So that kind of resets the uh, the, the application. So query and show it extent, what does it do? Um, it receives a number of object IDs, that's the currently selected buildings. And then it calls query extent on the layer view. So here's one example. Uh, I could have done that in the previous example actually as well. Um, but here's one example where I know that when the user clicks on a feature, it's going to be in the layer view. So um, I'm using the query extent on the layer view. Uh, what I get back is an extent, and then I, this is just some code that generates lines for this box. Uh, oops, and I add the result to view the graphics, and then and that that makes up this box here. So there's one uh, other important distinction between the query extent on the layer and the layer view. Again, you can call it in both. The query extent on the layer will return a 2D extent, only the horizontal extent, whereas the 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 query extent on the layer view will return a 3D extent that you've that you've just seen. And one, one thing that you could use this for is if you want the view to go to a specific area, um, to a specific feature, for example, let's say you have like maybe a, a, a drop down box for different buildings, and when the user selects one, you want to move the view there. Uh, you can use the query extent to get the extent of that feature, and then just do view that go to, and then it'll move there automatically. All right, finally, if you want to get not just the extent, but let's say you, you want to do something more complex on it. I mean, one of the things that you see here is that the, the extent is always aligned with the, um, uh, like, north, south, east, west directions, right? So it's not really a good representation for that building. It just gives you the generic area. One of the things that you can do already, what we actually do not have support for yet, is for you to obtain the 3D geometry for a specific feature. Um, that's something we're working on, but we don't have it right now. What you can already do is you can query the geometry from the um, from the scene layer, and that will return the footprint of that building. It'll return a 2D polygon with the footprint of that building. So um, if you want, for example, to compute a buffer um, uh, to see uh, like what are if there are any trees that are too close to the building, you could um, query the geometry from the uh, from with this return geometry here, you can then buffer the 2D um, 
polygon, and then you can see if there's any features inside that sort of 2D uh, extent or 2D geometry. Yeah, and I think that's it. Um, that's all I have for you. Let's see. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, as I said, check, the, check out these samples in the API. Actually, th that's the one that shows all of these things in, in yet a, a bit of another way. It's called um, Scene Layer fil Filter Query. And here you can see that on the one hand, I can select by a floor. Uh, so simple, to, similar to see through. But on the other hand, we have this legend here that shows the different usages. And you can see that the, the room count updates uh, with my current filter. And that is done using the, the query API. All right, so we have uh, some time for questions. Yes? Yeah, uh, you mentioned that Azure K has LE2, is that correct? LOD2, yes. LOD2. Do, you, do you know what kind of data you started or was started with this reference data? This here? Um, that was ba uh, that's basically BIM data, uh, but uh, in this case, that's, that's kind of an older data set which we maintaining. So I think these are basically policies, um, polygons. Um, per, per level, we have polygons, and then every room, we have polygons. In this case here, in the, in the Redlands case. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, what, what was the first, the first part of that? So the BIM? BIM? BIM, BIM uh, building information models. Building information models. So the granularity of features is something you have to decide based on your applications. If you want it to be one feature is one building, or one feature is one floor, one feature is one room, or one feature is the chair in the room, that is something that you need to decide based on, on what what you want, what question you want to answer with your application. Yes, please. Is uh, the see-through Zero app available yet? No. Um, um, no, not yet. Um, we think about it because uh, many people like it so much. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it was for us, it was really kind of like a showcase and test uh, example. But we have these kind of samples. However, when, you're, when you have a kind of in, important or, or interesting use case, then contact us and, uh, and we can see if we, if we can do something. Yeah. How do we deal with the Ah, yeah, I, I didn't talk about that because <laughs> I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, so so <laughs> this, this one, you mean? Because especially, especially the underground parkings or maybe there might be some offices where are the ground. So how do you mean how do we deal with it in terms of visualization? Um, there's two ways. Uh, actually, there's right now there's only one way you can do it, and it's it's not this one. So this is the visualization that we use in the scene viewer. It's not public API yet, um, so so you cannot do it uh, this way. We are working on it. This, some some something like that will come. Um, what you can already do is in a local scene. So if you use your own projector coordinate system in a local scene, you can actually go underground and you can clip the surface. So you can you could you could clip the surface to like a small part around the building and then you can just like turn the view around and, and uh, so look underneath. Minus, like, like for instance here, it will be minus one floor. Yes, exactly. Um, this data does not seem so, it would have to be the Zurich data. Um, the, the Zurich data actually has, has that. Um, so there's no limitation in the data that you cannot go underground. The only problem is how do you visualize it to the user? And as I said, right now, the, the only way that you can do it officially with the API is uh, use a local scene, clip the extent to around the building, and then you can actually see underneath it. So technically, it's possible to do Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you you have to go over pro for this. Uh, there there um, they have tools how you can get KML into pro or CD Engine. In CD Engine, I think you can import KML directly. And then you export it. You can you can publish it as as um, IDS layer, scene layer. So that's one way to do to do it. Yeah. Um, the procedural rules that you use to split. Um, Uh, would be possible, yes. Um, so yeah, uh, in, in so that was CGA, the compute, uh, this CGA language which we have for the shape grammar language. And there you could say, for example, uh, morph, 
um, if 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 you would have this kind of data, like you know, know the north side is 30% of the north. One thing we, we also have new now is we didn't have that back then is the area split. So it means you have a you have a um, arbitrary polygon like and a floor area. Then you say like okay uh, maybe um, 20 percent or, or, or 500 square meters are, are, are um, office on that floor in the south and you actually could really go and split it in a way that it's that the areas are perfect and you could align it so that it's on the south side. Is the, is the page publicly available? Um, um, this part not but uh, the area split tool is described in the CD engine help as in the CGA part of it so if you if you're into CGA and otherwise, also um, there's there's a forum uh, for CGA as a for for CD engine, and there people are discussing such stuff, and often people help each other. So when I when I get back to work on Monday, can I show my colleagues this? Is this a publicly available um, machine? Um, this one not. This one not. No. This we we only have demo demo permissions here. We don't have permission to give the data out, unfortunately. Oh, by the way, I should, yeah, uh, I should say thanks to the Dubai Design District for letting us show this, this data to you. But yeah, for internal uh, usage, just contact us. Yep. Can you post the videos to YouTube? <laughs> Same problem, right? Our sales guy. <laughs> um, uh, same problem. Um, uh, we are working on the on the permissions for 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 that. Okay. All so right. Thank you very much, and have fun. Yeah.